Well, we're here, guys. We're here. We made it. Another week. Well done. Welcome back. Uh, we weren't here last week, so if uh, you know, if I say, "Oh, who were you?" It's because we we missed you last week, and uh, we're pleased to be back. It's always good to be home. Rach and I were at a conference. Thursday to, well, we, went, we were meant to be there Thursday to Sunday, but our hot water system blew up on Wednesday night. Right, what is the go with those kinds of things happening right at the very worst time? It could have blown up Tuesday, it could have blown up, blown up Monday. No, it decides to blow up on the very night of the day we're going to leave the next day. So we left late, so we went to this conference in Brisbane, uh, our friend's church up there, and we're kind of like our mentors, kind of like our pastors, and it was a great conference, and then Rachel and I had a few days away celebrating uh, an early 25th wedding anniversary. Uh, and also I snuck a little birthday celebration in there as well as, uh, well, not because it was my birthday, wasn't it, on Friday? And so that was fun. <clears throat> and so we come back and I'm excited about this morning and I share with our team in a pre-service that I'm just expectant that God is going to just really move in our hearts and lives this morning. You know, I never want to become familiar with the experience of the presence of God. I never want to just come to church and just see it as another thing to do, another box to tick. I always want it to be, have an anticipation of the miraculous and the divine. And there are very few places in our life where we can kind of come together like that. And so I always want this to be um, just charged with an atmosphere of expectation. And so that's what I'm believing for this morning as we bring this message, which is in this series called Treasure in Heaven. And Matt shared an amazing message last week. So if you missed that, jump online, listen to it. You can hear it. Yeah, why not? Give him a... Why not? Give honour where honour's due. That was a great, um, great message. Check it online, YouTube, podcast, if you missed it. It was really, really, really good. Uh, and then uh, Treasure in Heaven. So we are up to this week in this series, and it seems like we've got a bit of a theme going. Did you share any jokes last week, Matt? Right. Heard they didn't go very well. So I thought I'd try and correct the ship this morning. And uh, I heard a few groans from the middle of the auditorium, but we'll just move on anyway. This is actually helpful for you. You should take notes. These, few, these couple of jokes, you should take notes. There's something deep in here and profound. First one is this. I, what are you, very, you're all listening. because <laughs> I used to think money talks. Now I realise it just waves goodbye. Do you like that one? Brendo, come on. You and me know all about the money that waves goodbye. And we, this is, we're on the same page with this one too. My wallet is like an onion. Every time I open it, I cry. Do you like that? <laughs> so I just thought, let's, let's be really helpful this morning. This message is entitled, The One Thing to Get Rich Quick. What do you reckon, David? <laughs> He's like, I don't want to commit to this yet. <laughs> because where are you going with this thought? It's a good question. I like your cautiousness. It's wisdom there. The one thing to get rich quick. All right. I want to take you to Mark chapter 10, verse 17 to 31. There's a bit of passage here. I'm going to read it out. We're going to enjoy it together, and I kind of want you to help me out and participate uh, as you're invited. Or, you know, you don't have to be invited. If you want to yell out, you can also do that at any time, which is quite common here at church. So Mark 10, 17 to 31 says this. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all the commandments since I was young. In other words, this guy's got a free pass into heaven. <clears throat> The story doesn't end there. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing you haven't done. One thing. Just find the person next to you and just let them know that there's one thing. Just say one thing. There's one thing. One thing. There is one thing. How many things are there? That's it. We can go home. Thanks, guys. Rach. <laughs> there is one thing you haven't done. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Woo! Come on. Turn to the person next to you and tell them, there is treasure in heaven. 
Now, you're starting to get a new friend now if you're sitting next to a stranger. Jesus says, once you've sold your possessions, then follow me. At this, the man's face fell and he went away sad for he had many possessions. Everybody say many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. This amazed them. But Jesus said again, dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. I just want you to notice here, pause. Jesus says kingdom of God three times there. The rich young ruler goes to Jesus and says, how do I get eternal life? And Jesus says, here's how you enter the kingdom of heaven. Here's how you enter the kingdom of God. Here's how you enter the kingdom of heaven. It's an interesting point to note. Put it in your back pocket. We might come back to it later. Kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Like, well, who in the world can be saved? And Jesus looked at them intently and said, Humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. And so then Peter began to speak up. And Peter was the rebel of the disciples. It's a bit like Matt Lee here in the front row. He said, we've given, up, we've given up everything to follow you, that he said. Yes, Jesus replied. And I assure you that everyone who has given up a house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake... And for the good news, we'll receive in return a hundred times as many houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children. I'm not sure I want a hundred times as many of children, but a hundred times the children and property along with persecution. I love how Jesus says that all the favour in the world is just as valuable as persecution. And in the world to come, the person will have eternal life. But many who are the greatest now will be the least important then. And those who seem to be the least important now will be the greatest then. One thing. One thing. Treasure in heaven. So let me take you back a few years. I had a conversation once with a, a friend of mine, a pastor friend actually, and we were talking about our life and dreams and ambitions. And actually we were in this office over here back when that used to be an office. And at one point he said to me, you know, I feel like I'm always just kind of one step away from, from really making it. Like, uh, you know, I, I'm like just one step away or just one opportunity away from... He said, there's got to be kind of... Maybe there's just one kind of secret thing that everyone knows that I don't know. You know, it, there must be just one investment I could make and it would, it would turn everything around. Surely there's an opportunity that I can step into that changes everything. And so what I discovered was he was kind of almost doing a little bit of a sales pitch on me here. He, certainly, he soon turned the conversation around and he said, uh, there's kind of this one little thing I'd like you to sign up with me, uh, sign up for me. It, it's a little bit of a, it's a bit of a get rich, rich quick scheme. He didn't use those words, but that's what it was. <laughs> I think he said it's a loyalty program. Uh, he said, if you've worked the system, then you can just take one step at a time and you'll have financial freedom, you'll have more time for ministry, life and family. And... Uh, I said, this sounds too good to be true. He said, oh no, it works, it works, it's worked for me. You should sign up to it. I said, okay, okay, okay. Look, so I'm sh this, this conversation went for a long time, you know, what a sales call's like. So we're in there, we've got the coffee, we've got the tea, we've got the biscuits, and we're going, he's in for the long haul. And so at the end of the, the whole spiel, I said, right, I said, look, I will, I will sign up to this scheme on two conditions. First one is that I don't have to give you or anybody else any money. And secondly, I don't have to do anything. If I, don't have to do, if I don't have to do one thing, I'll be happy to sign up. Because maybe he was right. Maybe this was the one thing that was going to change everything. Fast forward, the company dissolves a couple of years later. It doesn't cost me any money, except apparently I was accruing credits or something, and eventually they disappeared, and I uh, ended up back where I was, and I think he did too. But, but it led me to, to think, you know, we've kind of all been there, right, where we've all had this hope or this dream or desire that there might be just kind of one thing that might make our lives better. The one thing that might just click for us and turn things around. It might make us just a little bit richer, a little more fulfilled, you know, whether it's in the area of our finances or our relationships or our faith life, ministry life. We think, look, if we can just figure out this kind of one secret to unlock it all, then, then everything would be just so much better, so much easier. Things would move so much faster. <coughs> but what I've discovered is this. That is actually true. I've got some really exciting news for you today. 
Now, don't look at me like I'm the pastor in the office trying to sell you something. I, I, I'm not that kind of guy. But I do have good news. I'm going to tell you about the one thing. Everybody say one thing. One thing, one thing that you need to unlock everything. All right. I hope you are leaning forward because if this was me, I'm like, I'm, I, I'm like this is going to change everything. The one thing to unlock everything. The one thing that, that maybe could possibly help us to get rich quick. <laughs> <laughs> if it's that good, we want to know about it now, don't we, Brad? But before we do that, because it's found in Mark chapter 10, before we do that, I want to go back, because there's a couple of things we have to understand about Mark chapter 10 before we move on. Two things. The first one is this. Firstly, the kingdom of God, as it's referred to in Mark chapter 10, the kingdom of heaven, and, and even when Jesus talks about finding eternal life, he is never only talking about the afterlife. In fact, he is never talking about the kingdom of God being like an afterlife insurance policy, where that if you just find Jesus and you, then you don't have to go to hell. Then it's all about what happens then. It's never like that. In the text, in all through the Gospels, it's not like a get out of jail free card. The kingdom of God isn't just about then, about living life with Jesus in eternity. It is so much more about now and then. So the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, I love how Jesus does it when the rich young ruler says, how do I inherit? How do I get eternal life? Jesus says, well, this is how you get the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. This is how you get to live life with Jesus now and then. And right throughout the Gospels, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, inheriting eternal life is all about heaven on earth now and then. Are you with me? The second thing we have to understand about this passage, to fully understand the weight of what Jesus is saying here, is we need to step back to the first century context, the first century Jewish people have to understand their world. And in Jesus' time, wealth wasn't just a sign of financial success. It was actually seen as the evidence that God blessed you, that you were special in the eyes of God. Is this first century text? This is somewhat different today. Often we look at the rich and we see them as evil. In the first century context, except for the tax collectors who were evil operators, if you were the kind of person who was wealthy, had uh, had large assets, property, um, cattle, you were seen. God must love you. You are blessed by God, and so that is important to know because what we see here is that this meant that this man wasn't just giving up money. He was giving up honour. He was giving up influence. He was giving up security. He was giving up status. He was giving up his place in the community. He was giving up his identity. He was giving up what he thought was the most important thing to connect with God, which was his wealth. So the rich young ruler was asking, how can I get eternal life? Because I've got everything else. He was looking for a shortcut. He was looking for a get-rich-quick solution. He wanted to step into the kingdom life without any disruptions to his present life. He wanted to step into the kingdom life without any disruptions to his present life. And Jesus says, we reprioritize our entire life so that we can follow him. And it's not a command it's an invitation into a new, abundant life. And so, so Jesus doesn't tell the young man to give up his wealth because Jesus is against money. He tells him to give up his wealth because it's standing in the way of something more valuable. Yeah. Treasure in heaven. Heaven on earth. It was the one thing that stood in his way. The one thing that was separating him from heaven on earth. So what's the one thing standing between you and the fullness of the kingdom life that Jesus is inviting you into today? I'm not here by mistake. I'm not here by coincidence. I'm not here on accident. God has appointed this moment in time for us to connect at this level where the question I'm asking you is for you. This isn't for the person watching online in a week's time. This question is for you. What's the one thing that might be separating you 
from receiving everything that Jesus has for you in your life today. Please don't just dismiss this as one of those questions that's for the person next to you. Yes, it's for them, but it's for you too. And it's a question I've got to ask myself daily. Is there something today that's standing in the way of me saying yes to everything that Jesus is inviting me into? Heaven on earth, treasure in heaven, now and into eternity. What is the one thing? Is there one thing, Jesus? And if there is, what is it? That's the question. The rich young ruler actually had a big problem. Here it is. He had three issues to contend with. One, he was rich. Secondly, he was young. And thirdly, he was a ruler. (laughs) Now, those three descriptives are accidental. They're intentionally put there for us to understand the depth of the problems this poor person faces because of the same challenges and temptations that we all face every day. The rich, young ruler. He was rich. In other words, he had wealth. He had more than enough finance. He was young, which is representative of the tyranny of time. Because when we're young, we think that we've got all the time in the world. That it doesn't matter. We can follow Jesus when we get a chance. Like later on, I'll just do all this stuff. And then when I'm 79, 89 or 99, I'll just say, yeah, Jesus, let's go. (laughs) The rich old ruler would have been like, okay, I'll sell it all because I've got nothing to live for anyway. But you guys who are young, well, I'll just hedge my bets. See how we go. The tyranny of time. The rich young ruler. He was rich. He was young. And he was powerful. He had influence, status, authority. And that's hard to let go of. The three one things <laughs> that this poor, rich, young ruler had to face. They're the temptations that invite us to build treasure in earthly things and not build treasure in heavenly things. They're the same three things that we've all faced. When I was growing up, they were called the three Gs. Gold, Glory and girls. Yeah. Remember those? Yeah. Yeah. So do I. I mean, I was gold, glory. Thank, thankfully for me, I was gold, glory and girl. And uh, that seemed to work out all right. But yes, the gold, the glory, or money, power, fame, or fortune, influence, pleasure, whatever you want to call it. They're the same three temptations that we all face for all of time. And they're the same three temptations that Jesus faced in Matthew chapter 4 as he prayed and fasted for 40 days in the wilderness. And then Satan comes to him. You can find this story in Matthew chapter 4. Satan comes to Jesus after 40 days of fasting and prayer. And he's at his weakest human point. Jesus is there, hungry and weak. And in Jesus' weakest moment, it's important to notice this, that Satan often comes to us in our weakest moments, in his weakest moment, and offered him the opportunity to say yes to those three things. He said, will you say yes? If you want your needs met, all you need to do is turn these stones into bread to meet your physical needs. And Jesus said, no. And Satan says, well, all you need to do is throw yourself off this cliff and the angels will lift you up and rescue you to demonstrate that you are all powerful over heaven and earth. And Jesus said, no. And Satan said, well, why don't you bow down to me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world and you would be seen as all glorified. You would be able to be glorified by every person in the world without having to go to the cross. And Jesus said, no. The three temptations, gold, glory, and girls, or money, power, and fame. Jesus knew what it was to be tempted in all three areas of life, just like you are tempted. What is your one thing? What is your one thing? Well, before we move on, because I want to do something later. Not yet. I'm going to do something later. I'm going to give you an opportunity to consider what it is that God's speaking to you about in this moment. Uh, I said before, I don't want you to just let this pass by. Because I know that God is, is speaking to you right now. But I also want to give you some practical wisdom from the Bible about how to address these three areas in our life, whether it's greed, power, or fame. And it's this. Practical tips. You ready for these? If you're not already taking notes, this is where to start taking notes, James. Here we go. The first one is this greed or money. The Bible is so clear. There's one way, there's, there's an antidote to this temptation, and that is giving your priorities and your finances in God's hands. And we just did a whole four-week series called Because I Tithe, and that series talks about giving God the first 10% of the increase in our financial world. And what it does, it breaks the power of greed and wealth over your life. Budgeting, just generosity. It says, God, this isn't mine, it's yours. The antidote to power is to give your most valuable resource to Jesus. 
you know, I, I would argue, and I think the Bible teaches this, that the way that we address this, the antidote to feeling like we're in control, that we have all the answers, that we need to get it done, is to give God a day of the week. It's called the Sabbath. You give God a day, he can do more with seven than you can do with six. So the antidote to greed and wealth is tithing, to give God 10% of your first increase. Antidote to power, to feeling like you've got control, you can do it all and it's all about you, is to give, give God a day of the week. It's called the Sabbath. And the antidote to fame or to glory is submission to authority. This is a hard one for many of us. And you know, even Rach and I, as we've been able to lead our church, we see a danger in being leaders. And if you're a leader in your world, you'd know this too, that who, do you, who are you accountable to? Who are you responsible to? Who's encouraging you, challenging you, calling you to account? Who is it? And so Rach and I, I said we were at a conference the last weekend and that was all about submission to authority, going and seeing our mentors, inviting them to speak into our life and challenge us and our thoughts and ideas and vision for the future. So who are you are letting to speak into your life at a level that challenges your present situation? So come on, some of us, we just want to dismiss wisdom, we want to dismiss advice and we keep our world small and accountability structures very, very narrow if at all existent. But I want to encourage you, if you want to break the power of wanting glory and fame and being seen as having all the right answers, then you need to find someone who you can submit to and a mentor, someone who can encourage you, challenge you with all love to say, hey, I think you're heading in the wrong direction. So I wonder, what is your one thing? Is it your pursuit of security over surrendering your life to Jesus? Is it your desire for control over obedience to what Jesus is asking you to do? Is it your longing for status over being humble before Jesus? You know, maybe you're afraid to risk it all with Jesus, like the rich young ruler. Whatever it is, Jesus is looking at you and I today. I love this in this chapter here. Let's have a look at it. He says this, Mark chapter 10. One thing you haven't done. He says this. Where does he say? Help me out. He says, uh, I thought I'd find it here somewhere. Let's go. He said, uh, let's have a look. Your father and mother teach him. He replied, I've obeyed all the commandments since I was young. So here we go, verse 21. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. Genuine love. So even though this guy is going, look, I can't do what you're asking me to do, Jesus was like, I know what it's like. I've been tempted in these areas as well. I don't hate you. I love you. I mean, I genuinely love you. And in fact, in the Synoptic Gospels, Mark, uh, Matthew, Mark and, and Luke, there's no, this is the only book, Mark, that references this this moment of compassion and love for this rich young ruler. And I think it's important because it highlights the fact that Jesus has compassion, that Jesus has patience, that Jesus is willing to wait for us to find him. Our one thing is hard to let go of. Our one thing is hard to release. Our one thing is hard to surrender. And for some of us, it's more than one thing. We're rich, we're young, and we're powerful. And it's hard to give that all up for Jesus. So I want to bring the team up because I'm going to conclude now with this final story. Whatever it is, Jesus is looking at us today with that same love. What's the one thing that you lack? If you can give it up, you can follow me. So if you want to get rich quick, are you ready to get rich quick? I reckon you're ready to get rich quick. If you want to step into the abundant heaven on earth life that Jesus offers... It all starts with one thing, to follow him completely. And going back to our trip to Brisbane, I went, we've been going to that conference now for a few years. And in September 2022, uh, I went to that conference and I, I felt like there was something in my life that was a, a one thing, a one thing that just was a, not quite in alignment with what God wanted in my life. And I didn't actually, actually, to be honest, when I went to the conference, I didn't even know it was there. Maybe you walked into the room this morning and you're just coming to church. And now all of a sudden you're thinking, oh, Jesus, there's that one thing that you've been talking to me about for some time. And now the pastor's up there talking about it too. How did he know about this one thing? Have you guys been having a conference without me? So that's that one thing. I didn't know I had it. And I was at this conference and we're at, in a leadership talk. And the guy was getting up the front. So after this, after this conference, I came home and I journaled this experience. And I, I just want to do something very vulnerable. I'm going to read to you my journal entry about that encounter. And I'm praying that this won't be my story today, that this will be our story. 
and that as I'm reading this, if you feel prompted to respond to Jesus, to come and surrender your one thing, whatever that might be, I'm going to invite you to come forward. Again, let's do something a little different. I want you to come forward and just stand up here. And it's just, a, it's just an act of surrender. You're getting out of your seat with what it is that you want to give to Jesus and you're coming forward and you're saying, Jesus, I'm just going to, I'm going to give this to you. I'm going to give this to you right here, right now. I don't care who sees me. I don't care how I feel about how I feel. I just want to, all I want is you, Jesus. That one thing, I want to give it to you. I want to follow you. I want, I want heaven on earth today. I want treasure in heaven now and then. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes to, to give you whatever I need to give you. My pride, you know, my long for status, you know, my long for fortune, whatever it is. I'm just going to give it to you. I trust that you receive me as you promised. And if that's you, as I'm reading this story, why don't you come forward? The team are going to worship. And let me just read this story. Says, oh, I'm not sure how to reflect or journal what just happened in this session. I know I will need to recall it as I move forward with my ministry life because of how powerful it was, how transformational it felt, and how clearly I heard God speaking to me through it. Pastor Ken brought a message about the oil of the ten virgins needed to get greet the bridegroom from Matthew 25 and the oil that Samuel was told to fill his horn with in Samuel 16. The crux of the message was about seeking God for what matters most, his presence and not simply spending our time and devotion polishing lamps or in Samuel's case, I mean some of this you won't get because it's about the whole message that was preached but you just keep, keep with me not spending, simply spending our time and devotion polishing lamps or in Samuel's case lamenting the disappointments of the past I was quite stirred throughout the whole message and felt from the very beginning that God was trying to shake me to get to me to fill me with a fresh infilling of his presence. As the message went on, it was speaking more and more to my situation. I've been feeling dry and not oily, and like Samuel in the Bible had even put my horn of oil on the shelf. I felt God clearly challenge me to open up again and be vulnerable enough to let him do something in my heart, in my spirit. When Ken was wrapping up his message, I couldn't hold back the tears and couldn't stand under the weight of what God was pouring pouring into my spirit. It felt like he was pouring oil into my spirit. I also know that God wanted me to make to mark that moment by giving him something that would keep me focused on him and keep my life overflowing with the oil of the spirit. To give him something give God something, to give God that one thing. I got a fresh sense of hope for the future and a revitalization of my calling. I was reminded again that I'm called to be a spiritual leader and guide to bring to my world Holy Spirit encounters that change lives, to minister in the Spirit and to see the miraculous outworked in my sphere of influence. And so church, this morning, it's time to give up that one thing, whatever it is that might be holding you back and trust that the treasure Jesus offers is far more valuable than anything you can hold on to in this world. So team, let's just worship together for a few minutes. And as we worship church, if that's you, why don't you come forward and just surrender that thing to Jesus. Maybe I'll pray for you if I feel led. I don't need to pray for you for you to do this. Just come forward and say, Jesus, I'm surrendering this one thing and I'm inviting this heaven on earth, kingdom of God encounter into my life today. Who am I to? Let's sing. Come on, team. Let's sing.